right, we now uh, turn to this, which is launched today. We're very excited, uh, and proud to, uh, to launch this report. It took a long time coming. I think all, all in all, it took a year to develop this. Uh, it's only uh, 70 pages, um, which I'm sure we can read page by page tonight over a glass of wine. But um, now I'll present uh, to you some of the highlights, some of the key results in the methodology. Uh, I'll co-present this with uh, Philippe Dunch, uh, is in the first row here. Um, we hired uh, Philippe, um, who was working for the World Bank at the time, as a consultant to, to work with us on, on this project, develop the methodology, implement the data collection, analyze, and, and, and do the whole thing. So I'm really happy you are going to be here today, I'm really here today, Philippe, and uh, present with you today. Quick thanks to the donor, Jan already presented this morning. Uh, the is one of the donors. Um, other donors that have contributed funds to, to make the study possible were uh, Defit, the UK, and uh, Germany in terms of um, contributions to staff time. Yes. Right. So, why evaluate the campaign? When we entered these, this field two years ago um, or so, we saw a lot of activities. We saw a really sharp growth in campaigns that are implemented, partly by IBM, but also by a lot of other providers who are very active in this field. We saw an increase in funding by uh, governments, by the EU, uh, and others into, into this type of activity for awareness raising information campaigns. At the same time, we were wondering, what do you actually know about how this works? What aspects work? Which aspects? may not work, what is the evidence that is available to us in this field? Um, we read the Dutch report with great interest and, and we saw, well, there's a lot of skepticism in this field. There, there are a lot of critics that are skeptical about the impact, about the assumptions um, underlying this approach. But we said, there's hardly any empirical evidence. So, so as a data center, we, we um, started working in this field and trying to improve the evidence. Um, start with a project funded by DFID is now moving in the, in the grow. Um, we also see a push for better evidence and, and, and a better analysis in, uh, in the GCM. The, the Global Compact for Migration really uh, enshrines the data agenda and the agenda to improve evidence. And actually, in one of the goals, it mentions information campaigns directly and says we need to improve the evidence base for these campaigns. So, this is sort of the context where we started this work. And um, here's, just a, here's just a quick impression of all the campaigns that are out there. Um, we have websites, we have radios, we have town halls, we have moving cinemas, we have a lot of activities online, we have billboards and flyers. There's a whole range of interventions here. Um, but as we said, when we started the evidence was quite uh, limited on what works and, and what doesn't. Now, before we started, um, we did a systematic review of the evalu evaluations that we already have. So these were evaluations um, available or published in journals, but also in the gray literature funded by governments, uh, evaluation that the IO has done previously and others. And we not only looked at the results, but also looked at the robustness of the, the research, the robustness of the evaluations. And well, we came to quite a, a not so positive summary that a lot of the evaluations that we rely on, that policy makers rely on, are limited in, in, in a way that we can draw conclusions on them um, regarding the impact of, of such studies. And that's why, well, let's um, let's get into this into this work and try to improve the evidence with the with the new study. Um, We'll share the slides later, and, and, and for all those listening online, by the way, uh, my colleague Gustav will share the link to the study as well. Systematic review was published um, last year. Uh, yeah, quick comment for the for all the all the attendees listening online. Uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, I don't know if you can see us, but I hope so. I hope you can hear us. Uh, please tune your mic. Um, sometimes uh, everyone here present can hear what you're doing at home. So uh, please please make sure to. Turn your mic down. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Why am I this message? So we entered this field and we're really uh, approaching this with limited uh, knowledge about what's actually happening in the field. We're browsing for campaigns to evaluate and we're looking at the whole range, the whole portfolio within IOM but also outside of IOM and we came across this wonderful campaign that you just heard about uh, and they presented any. Um, Amount we were presented on, and um, we were really impressed with this campaign. We thought this would be an ideal candidate to actually do the impact evaluation on. Uh, first of all, it's a very innovative approach. We just heard about peer to peer. It's um, there's an emphasis on the local community, local ownership. 
Um, it increases authenticity and trust, and, and, and this we thought is an interesting mechanism to look at and to, to research more thoroughly. Um, there's new content to so the videos that Bretonese produce themselves. There are very targeted measures, uh, such as the town hall events that we'll talk about more in the study. And there is also the potential for scale up. And I think impact evaluations are always useful when you're thinking, when you want to know whether a certain approach works, and you're planning in the long term to actually scale it up. And before you scale up, you want to you want to learn uh, about which aspects work, what other aspects maybe need improvement uh, before before you scale up. Now, how do we measure impact? And um, here I'm going to hand over to Philippe to uh, yeah, explain how we approach this, how we design the study, and then uh, later I'll present the results of the, the report. This is a bit hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, thanks for having me today. Um, so, there are many types of evaluations. Um, ex post evaluations, process evaluations, before and after evaluations. And we argue that impact evaluation is actually the best evaluation method to evaluate the, the impact of the project. Um, the so called uh, randomized controlled trials are a subform of these impact evaluations, so sometimes we use those uh, synonymously, although there's a slight difference. But uh, RCTs are basically the the best way to do impact evaluations when possible. They try to um, they try to answer cause and effect relationships. Um, basically, the main guiding question is what would have happened in the absence of the project. Right? That's the true impact. Is if we could compare um, a state of the world with and without the project. So ideally, we would jump into a time machine and. Uh, observe two states of the world, one with the Migrants' Messenger project and one without, and just see what is different between those two worlds if we hold everything else constant. Um, now, I quickly checked, time travel is not yet possible. Um, so basically, RCTs are the next best thing to, to simulating uh, a time machine. And uh, randomized controlled trials are also used in other fields. Um, you, you know from the medical field, there are basically no drugs that can get uh, that can enter the market without first passing uh, through a randomized controlled trial, and um, this now also caught some fire in the, in the public, uh, public policy domain. And uh, yeah, with this report also at IMM, so that's exciting. Um, so I joined IMM as a consultant in, in last year in July, and uh, initially. My assignment was just for a month, and then at the end of that month, I, I talked to Amy and William in the car and said, I think this could be a great opportunity to do uh, this type of evaluation. And uh, at that point, uh, Jan also had already talked with Jasper about opportunities to do so. So um, I just wanted to commend the IM to, to do this, uh, Amy and uh, William Kreviger, uh, who was absolutely instrumental to make this work uh, without him. This project would not have uh, all this evaluation done. Not have succeeded, and um, also the donors, of course, for being you know adventurous and, and going along with this. And I also I remember talking to to William when we decided to do this, and I said, William, you he was the project manager uh, in the car. I said, uh, you were aware that there's a risk that we cannot show any results, right? And they, they, he's like. Ooh, okay, um, let's go ahead. I'm ready for that too. So you always need, uh, when you do these studies, you need project managers um, that are, that are open-minded enough and also can accept failure, because um, we also can learn from that a lot. Um, this was not a failure, but I've seen others. Um, so let me quickly talk about um, other types of evaluations to then come back to why impact evaluations are so important. Um, if we think about um, how evaluations are done at the United Nations or other institutions, it's, it's often in the form of before and after evaluations. So you measure your outcome value X before you start the project and then again after the project and you assign all the impact to that difference. And um, we say that's not the impact at all of the project because they're the the main problem here is the, the, the problem of uh, confounders, I think, which is that during that time, before and after, there are many other things that can happen at the same time. 
Um, it could be political developments, uh, social developments, the economy could go up and down, natural disasters, etc. So if we only um, assign all the difference before and after to our project, we make a mistake because we forget about all these other uh, influences. For example, imagine a, a training program for unemployed youth, and we, we, we measure what happens before, that people are not employed, and afterwards everybody's employed, and we say, wow, the project was super uh, successful. Um, we might mistake, uh, you know, the, the, that might have been caused by other circumstances, and in reality, our project might have done nothing to, to help. So, um, the, the core the problem behind this is the, what you've heard a million times, probably that correlation does not imply causation. Um, just because two things move in sync does not mean they're connected. Uh, unfortunately, this thinking is hardwired in our brains. It's very hard to get out of our brains. Um, and we also uh, read that in the news all the time. Uh, uh, American president, this one and the previous one would say, oh, I created X amount of jobs, etc. The big newspapers would write this also. Um, not in, in bad faith, but because there's a fundamental misunderstanding of these concepts. That, uh, it's very hard for humans to do that. And, uh, but this is why it's very important to, to think about this harder and, and go to the bottom of it. So what we need is basically a, a, a counterfactual, a state of the world. Um, basically, what I said earlier, what would have happened without the project. And uh, don't get me wrong, other evaluations are also very important. Um, process evaluations are also very important because we still need to understand um, how many people showed up to the events, how many people were trained, how many were the, were the funds spent uh, you know, reasonably, and, and can we account for everything. So, this is not to say that other forms of evaluation, especially process evaluation, are, are, are useless. Not at all. They just they have, should go hand in hand. Um, so the, the main reason to do an RCT is to, to create this counterfactual. Um, it's a very very easy concept. Very easy. It's harder to implement, but it's a very easy uh, concept. We make use of the law of uh, large numbers, which is um, a, a reality of the world. We uh, inhibit, um, and it always holds across all contexts everywhere. If you, uh, and that's the, that's the basis of the, of the of the RCT methodology. You start with one big group over here, and uh, you literally flip a coin, and you split it up into two groups or more, as you have a large enough group to start with. And what it gives you is two identical groups, um, and all the confounders that I spoke about earlier balance out. And this, as I said, this holds all the time. This is it's a, it's a, it's a basic truth of the, of the physical world we live in. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that it also balances out things we cannot measure, which might be even more important than the things we can measure, because we, we, we can measure the economy going up or down, or certain political developments, but there's a million things we cannot even see that impact our lives. And, uh, so that's also very important to understand with this method. We, we do balance those things out as well. We, don't need, we can't quantify them, and we, we can't see them, we can't count them, but we do know they're balanced out in two groups, so that's very important. Um, because if this is successful, then the only difference between those two groups is the project that we're rolling out. Um, and even after the fact, let's say we have two groups, uh, established two groups that are exactly the same, and now a big earthquake strikes, uh, we can also be confident that that earthquake affects both groups similarly. So um, the, the bias is um, eliminated. There's no bias, even though there might be big events happening even after the organization. This is all in the ideal case, and so it's always how it happens. But this is the, 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 the premise of this method. So then in the end, you have these two groups. You roll out the project, and you um, collect the data, and you compare the two groups. And because the only difference between the two groups is the project, all the difference you measure is the impact of the project. And this data collection happens to be uh, the most expensive part of, uh, of impact evaluations, along with hiring international consultants to help you do this. Um, so look, that was my little bit on the methodology. Now we move on to what we actually did. Um, so we couldn't uh, evaluate all aspects of the project. Uh, we focused on the town halls. Which were, uh, which were a part of the project um, because they were an they're important part of the project and also a, a controlled environment that we could you know, use this methodology with. Um, 
And we had two twin goals, actually, that are related, but not quite the same. The first one was, did the project work, right? This is what we wanted to know. Does, does this work or not? Um, but the second one was also, and I briefly touched on this uh, in the break with Jan, is kind of to do a proof concept. Um, can this work at all, right? Because as Jasper said earlier, we basically have zero evidence on any of, the, of these information campaigns. Um, so it was uh, important to establish that mechanism, that if we show this peer-to-peer -peer content, does that move the needle at all? And I, I talked to William when I was there, I said, like, we use these town halls to really hose down the potential migrants of this content, right? Because we have the town halls, we have the discussions, etc. So really throw the kitchen sink at them to see if, if it works or not. So, because um, if we couldn't establish that, then we were pretty confident that this was not a, a useful approach. Um, so, um, so we created the, uh, I don't know if this was mentioned, so the, the, the movie, uh, we created the documentary movie out of the, the snippets that were already collected with the community response app. So, in order to do the town halls, we put them all together into a 15-minute documentary movie, kind of the best off of the of these clips. This movie is available on YouTube. I think the link is in the report. I encourage everybody that works on migration to watch this. It's really amazing. The, the group and, and the car did a great job putting this together. And it's a very touching movie. It has English subtitles. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great watch, actually. Because um, without that, I think we always think about migration in very abstract terms. But once you set through a 15-minute movie with all these people, telling about their experiences, uh, it really changed the perspective even further. Um, so we had this movie, we made this movie and then had the in-person discussion right after that. And uh, yeah, I think this was mentioned before, a, a kind of theory of change was this emotional, uh, relatable content of people that look like the people that are about to migrate would have a, a, a higher impact than uh, just like, somebody lecturing from the top. And, and uh, what we also saw is that um, in our data, and we analyzed the data, and we knew this from before, that people have a general, generally very high level of awareness, but in abstract, abstract sense. And uh, so the goal was to make this kind of more concrete and feasible. Um, briefly on the outcomes that we measured, um, we measured subjective information levels, uh, factual knowledge about migration, uh, risk perceptions about migration, um, perceptions of returnees, because there is uh, stigma attached to returnees that didn't make it, uh, as more you also mentioned, and um, lastly, intentions to migrate, and Yasmin will talk uh, about the results um, in a minute. And then shortly uh, about how we did it, um, we, we selected eight neighborhoods in the car that were uh, migration prone, um, which overlaps with, with poverty, I guess, uh, largely. And we talked to local um, you know, decision makers and politicians and asked them to collaborate with us, provide us venues so we could do these screenings. And we decided to do 36 screenings uh, overall. And uh, 18 screenings were of our, what we call treatment, our movie, with a um, discussion with the returning migrants afterwards, an in-person discussion. And then we also had 18 placebo movies. Um, unrelated to migration. So we showed them a movie at the, always at the same day, two screenings, one treatment, one control. Uh, we showed the, just a movie about the Senegalese society. Um, and we did a, in order to get people to these uh, screenings, we did random walks in, in the car and invited over 8,000 people, 8,800 people. And each time we invited somebody, we flipped the coin. We did this on a tablet computer, but Every time we invited somebody, uh, we didn't know whether that person would be invited to the treatment group or the control group. And that way, we created this, these two groups that I talked about. The only criteria that we had for inviting people is they needed to be under the age of 35 and express a minimum interest in, in migrating and also in attending a movie because we wanted to make sure that our attendance is high enough. Um, and then we collected, while we invited them, we collected some basic information, sociodemographic information uh, about them. Um, and this is my last slide, so just to give you an overview of uh, how it turned out. So we invited over 8,800 people, um, and I think 1,400 showed up to the screening events, so we really needed to invite a lot of people for people to come out, um, because it was very, even though people said, yeah, they would be interested, it's very low level of commitment, so we, we had to invite a lot of people to make sure we get those, those people to the screenings. 
And then we refound basically 1,200 people three months after the event and interviewed them again. And we did this more comprehensive data collection. And because of some, you know, fishiness, people posing as different people, or people, um, you know, couldn't be found, etc. Or partial surveys completed, etc. We decided to be very conservative at the end and use a, a smaller sample for the analysis of 924 people that kind of went through the entire process, being invited, showing up to the movie, and, and being refound at Edwin. And with that, uh, Jasper, on the results. Okay, thanks, Mr. Felipe. Um, for those interested in, in uh, the methods and all the say the early detail behind it, there's a there's a whole section in this report explaining how how we did it exactly. And what most people will never probably uh, see, there is a 80 page annex, <laughs> technical annex for those who get really excited about tables <laughs> and figures and footnotes. This is, uh, this is going to be online and make this uh, in the report. All right, so let's jump to the key results. Um, as we said, there, there were sort of four sectors we looked at how well people feel informed subjectively, how well do they think they, uh, they know about migration to Europe, uh, regular migration and so forth, about the risks involved. Uh, what do they know? Uh, is there some sort of factual knowledge test that we can do, uh, you know, comparing? the information that potential migrants have against some information that we have with yeah, some accuracy. And then um, the, I would say the most important bit uh, of the study is to assess the risk perceptions of potential migrants. How risky do you think it is to uh, travel with regularity to, uh, to Europe? What are the specific risks involved and how likely do you think uh, they, will, they will occur? Uh, this was one of the key areas. And then lastly, also the intention to, to migrate irregularity. So I'll go through that. In a, in a nutshell, here are some of the results that we found. We found that um, the, uh, participating in those events increased the, the, how well migrants feel informed themselves. We found limited to uh, very little effects on actually hard facts regarding migration. However, the campaign really wasn't about providing uh, you know, the number of people that have died trying to cross uh, to Europe or uh, the specific costs of um, you know, uh, this migrant in the desert. That was not what the campaign was about. It was about emotional connection between the uh, two years. Now, uh, we see large and very consistent effects on risk perceptions. Um, we find a modest but consistent effect on uh, the perception of returnees that often face stigma, as we've heard, um, and, and the case was able to um, improve the perception of returnees themselves. Um, there is a limited effect on the perception of what are the economic opportunities at home. Um, and lastly, we did find an effect on the intention to migrate, uh, to re migrate irregularly. Now, I'm going to walk you through these four areas very briefly. Uh, I'll first present some context data uh, that, that we also collected at baseline, so to say, to, to, to frame, frame these questions. And then in the second slide, I'll present the impact estimate. So, um, and of course, there's a lot more in the report, a lot more details. So, this is just uh, some of the highlights uh, of the questions that we asked. Um, we find that. Does that work? Yes. So we find that 43% of respondents did not feel well informed about how to migrate to Europe. 37% they were not well informed about the risk associated with migration. So it's a discussion: is this high or is this low? Or right? in, in the literature, there's a, especially the critical voice to say, "Well, migrants are already perfectly informed; they know everything. Uh, why are we running information campaigns?" Well, we find sort of a different picture in the data. Actually, half of the respondents, or more than a third, uh, feel themselves not very well informed uh, about how to migrate. And this is very consistent with other surveys and other studies that we, that, that we have. Am I too loud, Ben? Yes. Should I step away? Sorry about that. Is this more comfortable? Okay. Um, 53. Percent of respondents report that they decide alone, while 25 percent identify parents as key influence. There's this debate in the literature and, well, also in the goal evidence of who actually decides. Is it the individual or is it the family that uh, puts pressure on the individual migrant? 
we see that uh, against the common belief, it's, it's not always the family that puts pressure on the individual. It's often the individual that decides uh, themselves, often without the family knowing, uh, and sometimes against the advice of the, uh, the family. So again, you see a different mixed picture here in the data than what we often hear in the, in the, in the literature. Um, now, the information sources, this is very consistent uh, with, with other studies that we have. It's uh, the largest source of information, uh, if potential migrants have information, is family and friends. And this, is, you know, this speaks to kind of the whole rationale in this campaign that these are the primary sources of information, and those are the messengers um, that, that, that are most relevant. Um, the internet, um, fairly low. There's a lot of activity online, but uh, we yet have to assess um, what the potential of online communication is to really reach out to potential migrants and, and, and change perceptions there. And there's an ongoing study that we're doing to kind of unpack how uh, does communication online work and, and what's the impact of that compared to offline approaches like, like the town halls. Now, the impact estimate. We find that participating in the events um, increased the subjective information level of potential migrants by 19%. It's, it's a 90 percentage point difference between uh, the mom uh, events and the control group. Um, we find a 16% effect on um, how well migrants feel informed about migration to Europe uh, more generally. Factual knowledge. And I should say, as sort of a word of caution here, there isn't, it's debatable whether there is actual factual knowledge in this area, right? Because we don't know accurately how much does it cost to uh, migrate to Europe, how long does it take. There's such variation, and most of the information that we have from service is quite anecdotal, right? And not rep representative. Um, we also uh, have a project at Dimdak that's trying to count the, the number of uh, yeah, missing migrants. Um, and of course, this can only be. Uh, a conservative estimate of what the true number is because we will never know how many migrants really go missing by trying to, to migrate to Europe. So it's debatable whether we actually can compare the knowledge of migrants regarding migration with accurate facts because the accurate facts, of course, um, you know, are, are available. But there's some questions we ask, for example, regarding familiarity and knowledge about asylum procedures and the legal context and um, present some results in this regard. So since 2014, um, an IO project estimates that there are at least 22,000 buyers that have died trying to reach Europe from West Africa and North Africa. 26%, when we ask potential migrants in Dakar, 26% say they don't know. Another 43% say they estimate that it's less than 1,000. Only 5% of potential migrants in Dakar estimate a number that's anywhere close to what we know from um, the IOM estimate, uh, and the IOM estimate, as I said, is likely to be a very a minimum estimate because there's a lot of casualties that go, go unreported. Now, the average asylum recognition rate for Senegalese nationals in the EU between 2008 and 2018 varies somewhere around 10 to 25 percent, so it's fairly low. Yet, approximately 73 percent of respondents did not know what asylum was, um, and among those that reported some economic reasons for, for wanting to leave, so those reasons that um, do not necessarily grant you sort of international protection and access to um, a refugee status, 40% thought they would be eligible for, for refugee status. So we see regarding the, regarding the legal status and the legal context of migration to Europe and, um, and some of the facts surrounding it, there is quite some misinformation. Now, regarding the impact, uh, impact estimates, we see very limited effects on uh, how accurately can you estimate the, the, the number of casualties, um, awareness of asylum procedures, um, and of course we, we were well, we were a little surprised, but then we were thinking more about it and, and, and realized, well, actually when you watch this 50-minute documentary and, and you listen to the discussions of the participants in those events, it wasn't about the how many, you know, are there 22,000 or 15,000? Or it wasn't about how do you apply for asylum and what's the formal procedure. It really was 
about the personal testimonies and emotional experiences of, of, of potential buyers. So in that context, I guess we weren't, we weren't too surprised that uh, we see uh, a little effect on, on factual knowledge. We turn to risk perceptions. Now this is combined the context and the, and the impact estimate. Um, we, first of all, we find a very high baseline. What we mean by that is if you, if you ask potential migrants in their cars, like how risky is it uh, to uh, migrate to Europe, um, you get a very high percentage of people, it's a very high percentage of people that say it's very risky, very risky, critical risk, a very elevated risk. Um, and, and here we only see the percentage on the, in the graph here on the right hand side. We see the percentage of people that say there is a crit there is a high or critical risk. Right? And you see, it's a over fifth, often over fifty percent, around fifty percent um, of potential migrants in that car uh, who say that. It's just a fairly fairly elevated base, I would say. However, um, we. If one of the open questions that we couldn't quite solve with this, with this one report is um, the difference between abstract risks that you think that could occur and risks that you think you might be exposed to yourself. So, so an abstract understanding of, of risks more generally and the likelihood of you ending up in a situation are two very different things. Um, so, we found very consistent effects on various measures of risk, um, risk perceptions uh, and the different bars here are representing the control group that watched the different movie and the treatment group that watched the Parkinson's Messengers movie. And you see across all these outcomes we see uh, a difference which is in most cases statistically significant, quite large and consistent. And here are the risks of, so what is the risk of witnessing the death? Um, experience forced labor, losing all your money, uh, imprisonment, deportation, beating, uh, food shortages, a risk of violence or the risk to life. All of these outcome variables were chosen based on um, the movie and the topics that were discussed in the movie and those were all sort of risks, sources that potential migrants talked about in their own experience. And we see that um, participating in those events significantly increased the, the, the risk awareness can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. Your conclusion from those distributions are there's significant difference. Right. But within errors, mm -hmm. you, you display the errors there. Right. Then to me, within errors, there's not a huge difference between the two groups. Am I reading that wrongly? You mean the confidence intervals? Yeah. Yeah. So no, across across, I think these are we had seven. Yeah, seven. Uh, eight or nine the report, I think six were statistically significant at the 5% level. Okay, because for, for me from here, just witness death um, and imprisonment are the only... Well, it's, it's hard to see, and for example, here, it's, it's hard to see from there, for example, but uh, most of the confidence intervals are not overlapping for the... Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> <Touch screen. laughs> um, most of the confidence intervals are not, are not overlapping and, and uh, most of these differences are statistically significant with the exception of, I think it was deportation and, and, and food shortage. Um, but um, you will see all the tables with the significant stars, confidence intervals, standard errors, uh, we clustered on different levels and all of that nice technical stuff, so you can find it all in the annex and some of it also in the, uh, in the report. Perceptions of rich needs. Um, we found that 30% stated that returning migrants should be ashamed. It's this question of stigmatization, and it's often brought up in these in these debates. Well, we actually we actually find not everyone thinks that returning migrants should be ashamed of themselves. Not everyone faces um, strong stigmatization, um, but it, but it's a sizable share. And 30% think that um, you know migrants should be ashamed, which is arguably a very high high percentage still. Um, in the in the mom treatment group, 58 or 58.6% stated that Virginese should be or could be proud of themselves, um, as opposed to 52% in the control group. We see it's a small but um, again statistically significant effect here on sort of how how positive you perceive uh, Virginese. Now intentions to migrate irregularity. We find that um, 
while 50% report that it's probable, probable, very likely or certain that they will leave Senegal in the next two years, 60% report that they would not consider migrating irregularly. So this is about a bit of a tricky situation because the intention to migrate generally is very high, we found, um, among, among, among our sample. Yet to, to report in a survey uh, that you would do so irregularly, which is a very sensitive question, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a very low, which asks the questions, well, there aren't many legal opportunities uh, to migrate, and it's also maybe a lack of understanding what the, re what the difference is actually between legal and irregular migration um, among potential migrants. Um, overall, uh, we found that attending those events reduced the intentions to migrate irregularly by 20% relative to the control group. Now, um, I want to talk about some of the limitations of the report, and, um, and I think this is very important. Every study has limitations, and, um, and they should be made uh, explicit, and you've got to be transparent, and in a way to find, so improve the next study, uh, improve the design, we have the opportunity going forward in this project to fill further gaps and to, to improve our approach. And by being transparent about those limitations, we can you know, invite more feedback and others to help us do a better job in, in the future. But some of the limitations of this study. So the time frame is quite limited. We, we, we measure the effects of the events three months after attending the event, which is, some might argue, quite a long time if it's about watching a movie and attending an event. The, the event um, was, I think, very memorable. Uh, most people that we surveyed clearly remembered the event. They remembered the key messages. Um, uh, they remembered where it was and so forth. So um, we would say clearly there is a measurable impact three months after, but what about the long-term effect? What about six months later or a year later? Has the event sort of produced uh, 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 further information-seeking behavior that leads to yeah, a, a sort of sustainable change in attitudes and perceptions that we don't know yet? Um, now, for this study, the, the scope is limited to Dakar. Uh, for many reasons it was, but this is sort of a pilot impact evaluation where we, where we studied the effects of attending events in Dakar. Of course, Dakar is a particular setting, and Jan mentioned earlier the, the question of external validity. I think we have to do more to, to assess what are the effects of these events in rural areas? Uh, what are the effects on women versus men? What are the effects on high school students versus, uh, you know, uh, yeah, workers. Um, so, so this they, they were very much at the beginning uh, with those types of questions and, and teasing out how generally this mechanism would apply in different contexts. Now, um, also the study was limited, as you've seen, on intentions to migrate, not actual migration, which is of course a big difference. Um, and future studies will attempt to to uh, to look into that and see. It's very tricky to measure, of course, actual behavior and to, to measure actual flows. But we'll, in future research, look into how to how to do that. Yet it remains sort of a, a general, I suppose, political question also whether we want to know um, as IOM whether whether uh, people move or not. Um, um, Lastly, there are, there are, well, like with every survey, there, there are some measurement issues. We ask some very sensitive questions, right, about uh, irregular migration, about um, people's own personal experiences, risk perceptions. Um, those questions, of course, aren't easy, and, and we have to tease out in the future how to best ask them to get the most valid answer. Uh, we're pretty confident in, uh, confident in our results, but we, we, we don't have much to work on on how, how to ask that question of would you migrate irregularly. It could probably make a difference on how you ask that question, how you frame it, how, what the wording that you use. In future research, we'll tease that out, how to, how to, how to ask that question, and that's this refers to measurement issues. So, overall, we think this is a, this is a really a, a great pilot study, a proof of concept, whether actually providing here to here information um, to potential migrants, whether that mechanism can instill some change in perceptions, whether it generally works. We, we trust this evidence that it can, and now we have to go beyond. And I think in the next presentation towards the end, we will, we will uh, explain some of the studies that we have now planned going forward. So, thank you very much. Uh, we now have some time for questions. Um, oh, my. I think it's better if we actually do something.
Senegalese family structure yeah. and how yes. parents treat their children. Yes. That, yeah. It's also, uh, I think we, we, we have a link on the report and it's on YouTube as well. I think was this a, it's a UN produced movie on, I have to check, but uh, not, nothing to do with migration. But it's also, this has the same length. So the, yeah. the control event was kind of this, everything was the same. The only difference was the movie was different and we did not have a obviously returning migrants speaking to the audience afterwards. Or we would do different um, I would say we would test uh, how we ask questions. I, I think I, I mentioned that how we ask questions, we would run some more pre-tests and see what variation we get on how we ask questions. Um, I think you know, the impact evaluation is often very technical, but what it really comes down to also is field implementation, and what, uh, and there you often need more time than you than you think. And I think 
in Philippe spent a lot of uh, time in the field and the whole uh, uh, team in, in Dakar did an amazing job there, but it was under serious time pressure. And I think if we'll do this again, and we will have the opportunity to do so, um, we would play and uh, we would plan way more in advance to give us more time to, 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 to set up the study and, uh, and do the data collection. I would probably also go with a slightly larger sample. I think this is good for RCT studies. This is, this is solid, but um, we were somehow limited in some of the um, heterogeneous treatment effects. So like the subgroups that we look at, you know, how is this more effective for women or men? Is this more effective for young people? Older? We explored some of this, but we were limited in terms of our sample size and how far we can go. So what do you think? I think we would probably go yeah. even larger. In the, yeah, we, 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 have no, uh, we did not understand how many people we need to invite to actually have people show up, right? So we were surprised by that. We thought 5,000 would be good enough, and then we ended up inviting more than 8,800, had to print extra invitations, etc. So everything was a little bit kind of, uh, we, we built the airplane as we flew it, basically. So um, what Jasper said about the size is true. I think one other aspect that could have been interesting is to compare the migrants as messengers to a more traditional information campaign um, to have those three like control traditional migrants as messengers that would be super useful um, when we again like when we designed this we didn't know how many people would show up we, we played with that thought but then kind of decided to be kind of more conservative and have at least something on migrants as messengers but I think that could be something interesting for another phase um, also what Jasper said earlier longer term follow-up could, could be interesting if there's more uh, funding available to see after three months, six months, nine months, etc. And um, also in, in other fields, you know, this edutainment kind of field where people get movies to change behavior, etc. Many people now have that, like, uh, this is just a one-off movie, so in the future it could be also something that's in the form of a TV show or social media exposure where people not just get in touch with it like once, but maybe every two weeks, every month, and to see if that has a, has a higher impact on those are just plays into kind of what can happen in the next phase I guess or in future studies but yeah we did this really hastily so you know, I think we're glad that came out that well so yeah, yeah just to, to add on that and slightly speaks to the question uh, from from over there about what is the type of information that potential buyers actually want and, and need I think we can do more there and, and we will do more there um, because yeah, we see this gap in how well migrants feel informed, not so, not so well. They're also, we find in terms of factual knowledge, they're very misinformed, but then the risk perceptions are fairly high. Uh, but this sort of begs the question of, yeah, what kind of offers, what information should we provide, even after the movie? Because the movie raises a lot of questions, and I think there is sort of this vacuum that we can step in to say, how can how can potential movies that are very, uh, migrants that are moved by this movie follow up with us? How can they reach out and ask for more information, maybe more legal information, procedural information, these kind of specific types of information? Right now, um, they're, yeah, they're, in the past there were limited opportunities, and that's what we work on to, to provide more of a follow-up. Because they, they did say, we see in the survey that people did ask for more information afterwards, and even if we have an impact with this movie, maybe that impact evaporates if they go to their friends and they tell them the wrong stuff again, right? So I think this is an opportunity for IBM to kind of have resources ready that are trustworthy that people can kind of engage with. Um, on the risks, um, I mean, that's a tricky question and an interesting question. Um, what also we saw in the literature is that people do have kind of ab high abstract risk awareness levels. And that is separate from the kind of individuals as this has something to do with me uh, risk perception. I think it's, it's a very interesting field to do more research on, but I feel this is kind of what we see here a little bit, is that people say, yeah, it's super risky, like very risky, but I'll go anyways, because, you know, I can manage, or from, it's not about me, like, uh, and I think we, this was part of the, of the, there's one strand of thought that says that only people die or run into trouble that are kind of weak or it's not smart enough and everybody thinks they're smarter than everybody else. So, if, you know, I'm just smarter than these guys. And I think this is what we try to do with this movie is to show, look, these guys that are returnees, they're pretty cool people, pretty smart people. You know, they are very resilient. And if you see that, you're like, oh, I thought only the kind of the weaker people don't make it. And you see these people that are kind of cool dudes and, and you're like, wow, like this could be me maybe, you know. 
So I think there's a gap between abstract and kind of concrete risk perceptions, but that's kind of conjecture. I don't know if that's actually the case. I think more research could dig into that. So. Right. I think we talked a little bit about what information is missing already on that question. I think uh, particularly about uh, yeah, legal contexts, um, the procedures, uh, how long it takes, how much it costs. We know from previous surveys that this is a, uh, one aspect that many minds are mis misinformed about. Um, on the question from, from Jaypal on, on the end line, I think we were, well I at least was very surprised how low the attrition was, and I think that's thanks to, to the great work of, of um, the team in Dakar, Felipe, and the survey company that we, um, that we subcontracted. There were a lot of sort of initial efforts to, to keep the attrition, sort of drop out from the study very, very low. We want to... Can you maybe go back to the table where you show? This one. Yeah, so we did like... Uh, Callback surveys after, in between, like the advance and the and the end line, to kind of remind people that hey, you're part of the study, and we'll come and make an appointment with you at some point. And uh, we had at the movie screenings, we gave out uh, like snacks, etc. So we kind of had some good buy-in with the people. And um, yeah, so it was 80, about 80 percent. The, the the areas were pretty confined, like we didn't have to travel throughout the country. It was all in the car. And by this point, we had like three, four touch points with the people because we invited them, they came to the screening, they filled the survey, we had the telephone numbers, the telephone numbers of their friends. But I mean, in the end, it, it did take time to find everybody. It's not, we did some interviews over the phone with people that were inside the country somewhere. Um, so it, the first, I don't know, first 800 were pretty easy and then, you know, it took more time to kind of catch everybody else there. And uh, we could have continued to try to find 30 people more, but at that point we were confident about the results. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's right. We have a table A4 in the annex on page two analysis of dropout. Uh, and uh, we look at sort of who's dropping out, how many, and what is predictive of dropping out. We find. Um, Older, older participants slightly more likely to not participate in the end line and also female potential like slightly less likely. However, this dropout does not vary by the treatment or the control. So we see the same sort of pattern for both. For both groups. Um, yeah, and actually on, on attrition and dropout, which is a huge problem for the validity of the study, right? If half of your sample you don't find in the second survey, you have a problem. And we're running another study in Guinea with my colleague Mario Luce, um, uh, you, you will meet her later on the, on the panel as well. Uh, and we were amazed how low the attrition is. Uh, but in Guinea, oh, we were, <laughs> you were not, we were having a debate about this. But actually we were sampling and surveying very rural areas, very small villages in remote areas that are very difficult to, to collect data in. However, actually, if they don't <laughs> migrate out of the country, people are not very mobile. So if you go to the same village half a year later, you will find the same people very quickly. That's, that's what I've learned there, and I, I, was, I was amazed by the low, low attrition in that context. Can I one follow-up there? Sorry, and it just sort of, you mentioned that this is a study that's very focused on an urban environment in Dakar. Is there anything you can say about how we might expect, either from findings elsewhere in the region or sort of from IOM operations in, in Senegal, that you might think about how you might expect rural or urban populations to be different here, or maybe that's a focus of future research? Many, many people also go, and maybe more of you know more about this, many people come from rural areas to yes. Dakar to actually use it as a hub for migrating out, right? I don't know, yeah. uh, this is kind of... Uh -huh. um, there are some, some um, and uh, how they do it. Uh, many people either come to Dakar or they leave uh, from Tambacounda, which is at the border with Mali, and if they want to take the road, it's sometimes easier. Uh, but for the, for the biggest part, they come to Dakar where they can find buses that are going to, to Mali and Niger to the, all the way to Libya. And uh, there is actually, and there are regions of, of Senegal, Tambacounda, yes, right, where migration is a uh -huh. larger problem than other areas. This, we thought about doing this in, in rural areas, but then decided to just focus on Dakar, kind of to do <coughs> something 
good rather than spreading ourselves too thin and then not be able to say anything. But uh, obviously, there. What's the other area? Istanbul and Kola. Kola. Those two regions are super heavily impacted by my outward migration, so it would be worthwhile to do something there as well. Um, uh, and we will. We have a study planned on uh, looking at what are the differences between rural, urban, different populations, uh, age groups, gender. Uh, so we'll, we'll take that. And one, one last follow-up on uh, So I work a lot in Nigeria on health issues and, and, and doing online surveys. I'm always amazed how many people we can find. I always say maybe one thing is that these people usually do not get to talk about themselves. So it's different like when you get called on your phone. And, this is a market research area. Yeah, yeah. uh, but if somebody actually can talk about themselves for, for 30 minutes and they never had that experience before, it can be kind of interesting for because we ask like detailed questions like how do you feel, what do you think about this, what do you think about that, and uh, you know, that it's not everybody is super turned off just because usually people don't have a voice and we say hey here's a, an opportunity for you to say something about your situation and people tend to mm -hmm. want to do that. Okay, we'll collect another round of questions and maybe also from the webinar, but uh, Frank. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to highlight one particular figure that you showed. <coughs> Um, relating to the awareness of the uh, risks that migrants face. Um, and that is the, the figure relating to the number of missing migrants. Since 2014, IOM, uh, with the help of MCD, which uh, launched this idea, um, has been implementing the Missing Migrants Project. Uh, we've collected data on, uh, we, uh, from around the world and show that more than 30,000 migrants around the world have uh, perished trying to reach their destinations. It is probably one of the most high profile uh, IOM data projects. It's widely cited around the world by international media, UN agencies, governments. But what your study shows with this new data is that the people who probably most, who probably most need to have this kind of information don't actually know very much about the risks because you showed that I think something like one, they think that the, the number of those who die is around 1,000, whereas the figure you showed was something like 22,000 in one slide. So that suggests to us that we need to be doing much more to reach out to that audience um, in the Missing Migrants Project in the future. Um, clearly, despite the fact that this is one of the most high profile IO <coughs> initiatives that we have developed over the last four or five years, we're still not reaching enough migrants and we're, they're not fully aware of the, the terrible risks that they might face. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, okay, see so that. Should we, Gustavo, are there questions from the webinar that we can... Uh, yeah, there's a few good questions from the webinar, so I'll just read two for now. Um, this is from Nancea from LM, LMU Munich. Um, have you tried to see whether the effect of the campaign differ for individuals with or without networks, family and friends abroad? If it wasn't uh, possible with the data collected, uh, just ignore. And the second question um, regarding methodology, to what extent did you manage to avoid response bias? Eventually, uh, the participant answering in a way they think you are expecting them to respond, which could impact the accuracy of the responses. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, Networks, response bias. Okay, we collect a couple more. Uh, yes? Sir? Yes, because we touched upon that topic now several times when it comes to misinformation of migrants. Uh, did you maybe learn something also about um, the false information, uh, which is, let's say, uh, <coughs> distributed by smugglers because the migrants are exposed especially to that? And it's always, you have to look at this as a dual uh, sort that you have to make migrants aware but also combat the misinformation uh, provided by the smugglers. So did you have any findings when it comes to uh, that topic? Because most of the risks actually uh, which you've shown and the awareness when it comes to risks have a direct link to the smugglers mm -hmm. and uh, what they're telling and saying and so that's something I would be interested in. Maybe two more? Uh, it's Joseph. Yeah, I'm just interested in your last point about the willingness of people to talk. Um, and linking that up with one of the earlier remarks that you were calling them community journalists. And is there some way of measuring or talking a little bit more concretely about the willingness of people to talk in this context? And you know what it, what it tells us for the future about how to communicate better, frankly, a good point, 
So if we go around telling people that, um, sorry, 1,000 don't die, 22,000 die, they're not going to believe us. So when you've got a cohort of people here who seem to be perfectly willing to be community journalists, trusted community journalists. So what could your study tell us about how we would recruit them in another context to pass that information more effectively? Mm -hmm. Oof, many <laughs> hands, oh my gosh, how to choose, yes, question? Oh, you already had one question, so let's, uh, <laughs> sorry. We'll, we'll try to include as many as we can. Uh, it's just a short question. You were saying that you, you've seen a difference between intention to migrate irregularly. Did you see a difference in intention to migrate at all? You said the number was high, but I didn't know if there was a difference there. Because if people aren't aware of refugee asylum, um, maybe just their intention to migrate might be interesting. Okay, five questions. Maybe let's let's go through those very quickly and do another another round. Uh, are we doing on time? Terrible. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, the question from the webinar on networks. Um, we have that information. We know how many people, uh, how many contacts do potential migrants have abroad? Do they receive remittances from abroad? Uh, we know about their household size and the household structure, so there's a lot of exciting research to be done here, but the problem is, you know, these projects are always structured in a certain way. You, uh, you try to get the main results out and then the project is over, so we're now in the process of trying to get more funding to tease out some of those questions and for example what is the relevance of networks and there are many other questions that we that we want to look into. It's possible with this data but we haven't had the time and resources to do it yet. So to follow up on that I think that ties in a little bit with what uh, Frank said is and, and I said this to Jan earlier also in the, in the hallway is that we, we designed this to measure the impact of the project and to, to do this research but we also have this unique data you know, about potential migrants from the car. And I think that can be exploited in different ways. And one way would be to look at who are the people <coughs> most prone to migration, which then allows us to tailor our messages towards that group. Because right now we don't know a lot about that either. And then that might mean that we spend a lot of resources on people that might not be even open to, to this. So the more we know about which campaigns work for which people, the better we can spend our resources. And and I think that's another way how this data can be useful and make these things also more cost effective if you use the data in multiple, uh, as multiple, yeah. and multiple purposes. There was, a, there was a question from the webinar also on response bias. We have a section, 3.6 <laughs> study limitations on page 27, where we write a whole page about response bias. It's an issue that every study faces. Uh, are basically respondents lying to you, right? And what is their incentive to respond to your questions uh, accurately? Uh, this, is, this is an issue that every study has. However, we have certain safeguards. For example, the interviewers were locals. They were interviewed several times over months. So there was sort of uh, an identification, a relationship with the study team. And there was no uh, uh, service or, or, or payment um, associated with it, so uh, there was no uh, particip conditional participation in an IOM project or anything like that tied to, the, tied to the survey. So these are some of the measures and there are others that we try to apply to reduce that, uh, reduce that risk. Okay. Let's first go through the other questions. And then on that, sorry, um, if you could comment on blinding, because um, you can prevent response bias by basically blinding at different levels. So the observer, the participants, allocation of the ceiling, whatever. So if you could comment now or in the future. Right, in the future. <laughs> we had some elements of blinding in there because we, the enumerators did not know who they were interviewing, if that was a person um, in the control group or the treatment group. So every time they re contacted the person, they didn't know who they were talking to. And then because some questions were not relevant for the control group, we had like a, a skip pattern uh, programmed into the survey that later you would know. But we tried to do a little bit of that. Also at the invitation stage, we had a coin flip implemented in the, in the computer that says this is a treatment or a control person. So the enumerators that we, that we recruited were not deciding anything or we're not aware fully about who's going and where, etc. So this is not full to the, the total solution, but uh, it goes in that direction. Um, oh yeah, uh, 
how to recruit uh, messengers. Uh, I think that's a bit, be, bit beyond the scope of this. Uh, could be interesting, could be another interesting study to kind of look into who are the best messengers. Um, uh, we did use the movie to, well, we, when we cut together the movie, we tried to, you know, do a best of, because some, some messengers were just not as convincing as others, so there's definitely steep kind of differences, right? Well, we do, yeah, like, sure. Some are just amazing storytellers, and others are not so much, so um, kind of this is a bit beyond, but it's super important that this gets continued. We should definitely focus on people that are good at this and, and train those. I, I don't know how to best find them, but... Um, Maybe we're running another event federation in Guinea, and there's a sort of association of returnees that you know organize themselves, that institutionalize themselves, and that I think created. And we worked with them directly for the data collection, actually employing them uh, for for data collection, and they did an amazing job. But I think this this institute, this organization, increases the confidence because you know they find like-minded people with a similar past and. And, uh, and I think this helps them also to speak out and to be, to be confident to share their stories. And uh, the more I could support this types of uh, association, I think that would be a good way to good way to go. Um, false information from smugglers. So this is also slightly beyond the scope of this study. Um, there are other surveys out there that quite in a detailed way show what is the misinformation spread by smugglers. Um, but for example, here we didn't know, uh, we didn't ask the potential migrants directly, sort of, what have you heard from smugglers? So it's hard, it's stupid for me to answer this, but um, other studies have shown the level of misinformation and what exactly they're misinformed about and how they're getting that information. And I'm happy to share those references uh, with you. We did ask, I think, if they were in contact with the smugglers, and most of them said no. And this is conjecture too. I think the latest uh, information is. There's no lack of information, right? There's like everything about migration, UN, government, social media, whatever, like bots from Russia, I don't know. I don't, uh, but uh, so there's information everywhere. I think if somebody decides to migrate more than you might know it's better than me, but it's not like there's like a Facebook ad and you call a number and you go like, you know, it's more like you make the decision to migrate and then you go through your networks and kind of get a referral and, and people, because everybody knows somebody that migrated, sure. so you kind of get like personal referrals, you know, go with that guy or that help, you know, a new, you know, last year, so it's, it's more like that, but I think the smugglers, and this is also conjecture, I think they come in after the decision was made when you kind of get into actually doing, uh, doing the migration. Last question on regular migration. Uh, right, we, we did ask sort of general migration intentions regardless of the regular regular. And we also asked, um, have you made any preparations for a move, not necessarily regular? We do find an effect of the campaign on kind of reducing the uh, percentage of people that are preparing a move, it goes down. We find a small effect on regular migration, but it's not, um, it's not significant and it's small. Uh, so, so, yeah, it's difficult to interpret those findings, but generally we, we think that, you know, this information campaign doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, it doesn't do away with your general intentions to want to leave, but maybe changes the form in which you want to leave and, and, and how. Uh, lots of migration, also regular migration happens intra-Africa, so most regular migration is actually between countries in the region. And for many people that we interviewed, regular migration to Europe is not even on the table. That doesn't exist as an option. You can't just like, go and apply or something like that. So anybody that wants to go to Europe has to go the regular. People that want to go regular, uh, migrate regular, they usually tend to go to other countries in the region. More questions or? Last round, Amy, or? Yes, one more. <laughs> Hi, um, yeah, I have a comment and question. First of all, uh, I think it's it's amazing that we're doing this kind of work now on project reviews. I think it's uh, amazing we have a donor that's supportive of this kind of process. It's rare to find. Um, I think sometimes we're willfully blind to how effective these kinds of campaigns are. So I, I really I take my hat off to the to you guys for doing the work and for the process and to our friends from from, uh, from Holland. Now uh, my my question is uh, on the front end. So we've done this marvelous job at the back end of the project to identify impact. And I'm just curious at the front end because there's a, there was a slide a little bit earlier that identified uh, you know, migrants. We, we, we take this as a, as a given that migrants are trusted voices. Um, but in my experience running campaigns, there are many trusted voices within the community. 
Uh, so I'm just wondering if any thought has been given or what your thoughts are about doing like, an insightful market survey prior to the campaign to identify other influencers, other, other influential voices um, within the community and to bring them into the tent as well as part of the process so that people who are uh, considering a, mi a migration option when they go looking for information, when they go looking for feedback, are actually bracketed by members of their own community, by members of their families, by the shopkeeper, uh, by the school teacher, and that type of thing. Uh, so I'm just curious as to whether or not this is something uh, we ought to be looking at uh, down the road. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just make a comment on that? Just, there's one slight thing about this campaign which we haven't mentioned, which is, I don't, it's not a flaw in the campaign, but it, I think it made it easier is that everybody's coming back from hell. Like they've all been to Libya. They've all had a terrible time. So that's not the case necessarily for return migrants in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so the study only focuses on returning migrants. It's not the entire cycle of migrants. Some might be successful, some might die on the way. So the risk perception might be overestimated or underestimated. <coughs> Last one. Oh, one more from the webinar. This one, and then one more from the webinar. Maybe is there a this one? I was just wondering if you had considered or are considering using social media as another additional data source, so Twitter, Facebook, and monitoring in that side of things. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're asking. Is there one more from the from the webinar? From the yeah, so this is a question regarding comms. What communication tools were used to convince the target audience to watch the film? Was there a number of tweets, Facebook posts, etc., used to inform the target audience to attend the film screenings? Uh, okay. I can answer that. So we, we invited them on the spot and then we collected their phone numbers, we, we sent them text message reminders, we sent them, we, we called them. He said there's food. <laughs> yeah. Actually, so when, uh, when Moa do uh, the first screening didn't go that well. There was like five people at the screening, and then we had to kind of up our game in terms yeah. of getting five people. Exactly. Yeah, add a little bit of incentive to, for people to show up. The incentives were always the same for both groups, but it was definitely uh, not easy to get people <coughs> to take an hour or two hours of day to come to the screenings. So you invited as IOM? No. No. Okay. Um, the other questions. Retro so for the returnees that were the messengers, were they a selective group, right? That obviously kind of drive the agenda and the messaging there. That's that's true. But the approach was to counteract the the misinformation by smugglers and and lead to a more balanced balanced information, balanced story by providing that one side of the story, right? The, I would say that you know, the dangerous side in that particular perspective. Um, but uh, this ties back to what Leonard said. I mean, in the future, I think these campaigns could be adjusted also to reflect broader experiences and not just Libya and the, hor the horrors of Libya, but also other stories um, that could be included. I mean, I think as IOM, we want potential migrants to just have uh, accurate, balanced information so that they can make informed, safe choices. and. Um, Information that they that many have before they leave is, is biased towards one area, and the attempt here was to sort of unbiased it towards the other direction. Um, but yeah, there's more to be done in this area. Um, Let me follow up quickly. Mm -hmm. So the yeah, it's definitely not a full picture of all migration experiences. That was not the goal of this. So this the movie is a bit biased. I mean, we did have returning migrants that went through hell and said they would go again tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, they're like, I've been beaten, my friend died, and this is my third try, and you know, in a month I'm going for my number four. You know? So we did not have those messages in the movie. Because, uh, in the end, the goal was to kind of have people not go on a boat and potentially die on, on the sea. So um, just to follow up on that. Uh, uh, on social media, um, yes, I'm glad you asked me this because we're launching a new study that is looking into social media. There are a lot of high hopes with social media because um, you know you reach supposedly reach a lot of people very quickly with with low at low cost. 
But then we're asking, who do you actually reach? Who are these people that are uh, uh, reached by Facebook campaigns? And, and you know, how do they actually engage with the content? And what kinds of approaches to engage in those target groups are more effective than others? What kinds of content is more effective? This is a this is a upcoming evaluation that we work on. In, in, the, in the context of this study, there was no social media. We were, uh, the problem with social media is, and maybe Jasper finds a way to do this, is that it's hard to do to get a control group because the message spreads so like uh, fluidly through the network. So even in our control group, we cannot say that we're not exposed to Microsoft Messenger or clips. Right? But our theory of change was that you need to be at the movie, get the 50 minutes, get the peer-to-peer, -peer, like in-person messaging to actually internalize all the information. Right? But because there's so much information in the social media, in the car, everywhere, um, there's nobody that has not been exposed to that sort of information. Last one on uh, other sources, trustworthy sources. I think we do have some data on who people consult with. Um, friends, family, uh, internet, etc. I think super interesting to, especially if, if we want to do something like this cost effectively, it would be very useful to, once we have a message that we think kind of works, to work with community leaders, maybe uh, religious institutions, mosques, uh, or even like famous soccer players, you know, like kind of get celebrities, local celebrities involved to kind of, that, that would be useful. I think. We try to do here is show kind of get that first mile done. Like, can this have an impact at all? And then down the road, you know, we need to find the best and most cost-effective channels to transport that message. The, the way we did this is not the most cost-effective one because we had screening events, inviting people, running all over the place. So maybe it's more impactful. Because I think the fear I have is that everybody goes for gold in this game. Everybody wants to have a celebrity. Yeah. And. Where's the evidence that that works at all? Yeah. I mean, you have evidence that this works. Right. So why, 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 why jeopardize this for something that's just a nirvana that you can't reach? That's a good one. Okay.